Good morning, folks. Here we are, or good afternoon. Here we are. This is Monday, May 20th, 2 p.m. And like the invitation I gave last week, there is still approximately 300 empty seats here. So if you would like to come down and join us, uh, we're available for, we can still accommodate a couple more hundred people. Now, I will say that next Monday, I will not be here. So it'll be two weeks from now when I come back, and that will be June the 3rd. So uh, let's get started here with a word of prayer. Father, I just thank you for the word that you have given me, and Father, I just pray that I can speak it to glorify you, speak it that the people can understand it the way I understood it when you give it to me. And Father, I just pray that we take this word and we use it to further your kingdom in Jesus' name. So if you have your Bibles with you today, turn to Joshua chapter 24, verse 14. <clears throat> During this election year, we may not think it is that important to vote, but I'm here to tell you that you have the deciding vote, and I'm going to show you this throughout scripture how our vote counts in joshua 24 14 it says now therefore fear the lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in egypt and serve ye the lord and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose this day, or choose you this day, whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So you see, in every situation that we come up against or come to, uh, there's three choices, or there's three votes. One is God's vote. The other one is Satan's vote. And the tiebreaker is your vote. So your vote is always the deciding vote. Now, to, in the example above here, where Joshua is telling the people, you need to choose this day whom you will serve, so they're either choosing to serve God or they're cho choosing to serve these false gods, which are all, all the false gods or gods that is put forth uh, by Satan to draw us away from the one true God. But as you go on down a couple of the, in the next verse, after Joshua give them the choice, the people said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. That's verse 16. <clears throat> then the, the people went on to speak of all the things that God had done for them. He, he, uh, all the plagues that he put on the Egyptians, how he opened up the Red Sea, how he kept them through the desert with, with uh, manna and quail, and, and how um, you know he brought water from the rock, and different things like that. But then Joshua answered them. He gave them a warning, and he said if they didn't follow through with their words in verse 21, oh, if they didn't follow through with their words, that there was going to be consequences. But in verse 21, the people said to Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. So Joshua said, Okay, if you're going to serve him, I want you to make a vow today that you're going to serve him. And on down in verse 24, it says, And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God, we will serve, and his voice will we obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. So he made it a law and right there in Shechem. And then what he did, he put up a stone for remembrance so that whenever the children of Israel would see this big stone sticking up, it would remind them of the vow that they took. 
He also wrote it down in the book of law. This is what they said that day, that they were going to serve God. That was the vow that they took. So the big stone was to remind them and their descendants of the decision that they made or the vote that they, that they uh, gave that day. So they voted to serve, the, serve God, the one true God, instead of follow after Satan and his many false gods. But then it goes on, uh, this is several years later, I don't know how many years later, in Judges 2, verse 7, it says, And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work, works of the Lord that he did for Israel. So that generation that had seen all the, the miracles, now you have to remember the first generation died because they didn't go into the promised land, but their children, they seen what God had did. So they was just kids when they seen this, and they seen all the, the miracles that God did, and they served God their entire life. But then the next generation come along in Judges chapter 2, verse 10, and it says, And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel, Israel's unfaithfulness. So, it goes on to say how they were unfaithful in verse 11. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Asherah. So you see, there was three votes. God says to follow him. Satan says don't follow him. So you have the deciding vote which way you're going to go. And here's the thing here where all the children of that generation follow God but the next generation didn't. So you see, God has no grandchildren. He only has children. So it doesn't matter how much your parents did, doesn't matter if they was missionaries or if they, they were pastors or what they were, that means nothing. You have to make your own vote. You have to cast your own vote and you gotta decide who you will serve. All through the Bible, <clears throat> yes, all through the Bible, we see how people were given their ballot to cast the deciding vote. Some voted as God did and some not. So even from the very beginning, you know, God said to Adam and Eve, don't eat of this tree. You can have every tree there is in the garden. Just don't eat of this one. So God said, don't eat of it. Satan said, oh, you can eat of that tree. Well, they decided to vote for Satan. Right from the very beginning. Then you hear about their children, Cain and Abel. Cain decided, God says, you know, he wants certain sacrifices for himself. But Cain decided, oh, this is good enough for God. I'll just give him a couple vegetables or something like that. Well, he, God said he didn't like it. Satan said, oh, that'll be okay. He chose Satan. So all through the Bible, you see where this happens. Abraham, he, God told him to leave the land where he lived and to move to a place where he would show him. Well, Satan didn't want him to do that. He didn't want him to, to obey God. But Abraham decided, I'm going to follow God. But then you see, 
where God gave Abraham a promise of a child and many nations would, would come from him. And he was like 75 years old and he hadn't had no child yet. So his wife said, why don't you go in with my maid servant, Hagar, and have a child by her? Now you see, God's vote was, would have been, don't do this. But Satan is telling him, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. The promise hadn't come true. You're going to have to make it come true. Well, in that instance, Abraham voted for Satan. But then, as it goes on, he followed God's commands, and even in two, when he had his son Isaac, and God asked him to sacrifice Isaac to him, and Abraham went, and uh, as they were going to sacrifice, it said him and his servants and Isaac, they went to the mountain. And, uh, and when they got to the mountain, he told the servants, stay here, me and my son, we'll go and we'll sacrifice. And they carried the wood, and it said they carried the fire. So somehow they must have had something that they could keep fire in so that it wouldn't go out. And, uh, and as they were walking up, Isaac said to his dad, he says, well, I see the wood and I see the fire, but I don't see the the." animal i don't see the lamb and abraham told him he said god will provide he will provide his own sacrifice so they get up there and abraham puts the wood out well he first he builds the altar puts the rocks down puts the wood out and ties up isaac and puts him on there and when he's about to sacrifice him of course there was the the sheep or the ram caught in the thicket and god said don't sacrifice your son don't kill your son i know that you will obey me now so in that instance abraham voted for god he was the deciding vote he decided not to um, obey satan you know it's the same way with caleb and the 12 spies <clears throat> you know caleb he said we can go into the land because he heard the promise of God. God said this is your promised land that he was going to give them. All they had to do was go in and possess it. But the other uh, ten of the spies said, oh, we can't do it. And then they convinced the whole Israelite um, clan or the whole Israelite a congregation to forsake God and not go into the promised land. <clears throat> so that day, all the Israelites voted in Satan's way. Thank you, Lord. You know, uh, when I first gave my life to the Lord, uh, some of you know my my uh, testimony, but I gave I gave my life to the Lord when I was 13 years old. Well, every year I would sort of drift off. I'd start voting for Satan again, and then the next year a revival would come around, and we had revivals once a year, and I would walk back up front again, you know, give my life, dedicate my life to the Lord. You know, here I am, Lord. I'll serve you, and then about two weeks later, you know, I'd be turning away from it. I'd forget all about it, and this happened for 19 years in a row. So I was about 32 years old when I decided to follow God, and when I decided, when I put my mind to it, when, when I vowed I will follow God I w with no turning back, and I did from that point on, from the time I was 32. And one of the first things he told me when I decided to follow him was give up these parties that we throw. We used to throw some pretty big parties, and we used to go to friends' houses who throwed pretty big parties. So I had to give that up. So it, he was saying, don't party. Satan was saying, party. And Wayne said, I'll follow God. I'll, I'll vote for God. I'll, I'll vote his choice. So then I... I didn't do, go to the parties anymore. 
And when I first give my life, turn my life around, I knew I needed the word. So any day that I knew that there was a church service anywhere I would go, I was probably going to church around five days a week, an average of five, five times a week, because that was all the services that I found at that time. And, but God was saying, come, follow me, learn about me, be my disciple. And Satan was saying, oh, you got other things you need to do. I voted with God. I was the deciding vote. I just started, I started doing what God said. I went to church almost every night. You know, and here was a big one. Um, I used to like to go hunting. In fact, uh, at one time I was hunting in four different states. And uh, God told me, he said, you need to give up hunting. Well, now some of my friends really thought I was crazy, and especially my family members, because they said there's no evil. There's nothing evil in hunting. Why would you give that up? Some of my hunting buddies and, and like I said, my relatives, my whole family come from, a fa uh, come from a hunting family. They all loved to hunt. But it wasn't that hunting was evil. But as God told me, when you're out there hunting all the time, you're taking time away from me, and you're taking time away from your family. So give up hunting. So God said, give up hunting. Satan said, oh, there's nothing wrong with hunting. You can do it. And he spoke through a lot of voices. There wasn't any voices on the side of God. It, it was, I was like Caleb against all them other ten spies. But I voted, stop hunting. But you know, later on in life, about 10 years later or so, God said, he released me and said, you can go hunting now. Your son's old enough, he can go. It'll give you family time. And I know that this won't be a God that you will serve. So I, eventually I went back into hunting, but I don't even go every year anymore. If I get to go out, it's fine. If I don't, it's fine. And a lot of times when I go out, I spend time with the Lord while I'm out in the mountain hunting and, and doing things like that. But like I said, there was friends and family that thought I had went off the deep end. So anyway, after Joshua and that um, generation had died, and then the next generation, they turned from the Lord. And I'm going to give you some examples. All through the book of Judges, we see how the Israelites kept changing their votes. The first time was uh, they, they decided to start following these other gods. Well, the king of Mesopotamia come in and conquered them, or conquered part of Israel. And for eight years, he ruled over them. So they were like slaves under him. And they started crying out to God. They said, God, we want to change our vote. <laughs> you know, that's the way it is a lot of times. When things start going wrong, that's when we look for God. But we should be seeking God in good times and in bad. If you, we seek him uh, in the good times, a lot of times uh, these bad times, some of these bad times won't come along. Like it says in Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these things will be added unto you. Instead of going out seeking these things, God, a lot of times, will give them to you if you seek him first. So anyway, this king um, of the Mesopotamians uh, was ruling over them. And God called a, a gentleman by the name of Othniel. Now, Othniel had a choice. He said, should I listen to God? and help free the Israelites, or should I just stay where I'm at? He voted to, to go God's way. And then he delivered Israel out of the hand of the king of Mesopotamia. Now, then after, and, and, then, and then the people served God the rest of Othniel's life. But soon as Othniel died, what do you think happened? That's right. 
they turned away from God again. They voted for Satan. Then they started serving other gods. Then the king of Eglon, or <coughs> King Eglon, I'm sorry, of Moab, come in and came over to them. And he, he had them in bondage for 18 years. And during that 18 years, they started wanting to go back to God. They started crying out to God to send them someone that could, that could um, free them from King Eglon of Moab. So uh, God called up a, a gentleman by the name of Ehud, Ehud or Ehud, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name, and God got him to lead Israel. And uh, Ehu, he, he went and he went to see uh, Eglon, and Eglon was a really big man. And he said, I have a present for you, uh, but I, I don't want to give it to you in front of everyone. So, so uh, Eglon took him into his inner parts of his castle. And when he did, Ehu, he took a, he had a short sword and it said he sunk the thing into his belly so far that even the shaft and the handle and everything went into him. And then he ran out a, a window, jumped out, and, and run away. And he slaughtered king, uh, the king of Moab. And the children of Israel rose up, and then they fought against the Moabites and defeated them then. So, and then the Israelites followed God as long as Ehud was alive. But as soon as he died, they turned back away. So they turn away. God sends another country in. Jabin, king of Canaan. He come in and he had a general by the name of Cicero. Cicero. And they reigned over Israel for 20 years. So each time it gets more, you know. They can't learn their lesson. So he reigned over them 20 years. So God called. And then when they turned away from worshiping Baal and, and Asherah and all these other false gods, and they come back to God and cried out for help, he raised up a woman this time by the name of Deborah. And Deborah, now you see, even though the children of Israel sometimes didn't vote God's ways, these judges had to vote God's way. They had a choice also. You know, they could have ignored God and voted Satan's way, but, but they voted God's way. <clears throat> and Deborah went and she got Barak to be the leader of the army because it wasn't proper for a woman to lead the army, even though she was a judge and uh, she heard from God. She was like a prophetess, I guess you could say. And uh, she got Barack, and Barack said, oh, I'm not going to go unless you go with me. He said, I'm not going to go out there by myself and, and lead this army. I want you to go with me. So Deborah said, okay, I'll go with you, but I'll let you know that a woman will get the glory for this victory and not you. Well, God will get the glory, but a woman will be um, be the one that that is honored on man's side for getting the victory. So they went out to war. They they come against him and they come against Sisera, and uh, they started to drive the enemy back. And Sisera went and hid. Um, he went in a uh, like a village or. A, it wasn't really, it was like a nomadic tribe of the Kenites. And he went and hid there. And a woman by the name of Jael, she was the wife of Heber. She said, come into the tent and hide. So Cicero, he went into the tent to hide. And he said, give me a cool drink of water. And she said, I don't have any water, but I have some milk. And she gave him some milk, and this milk made him sleepy. And uh, so while he was in the tent there hiding from the Israelite army, 
he laid down and went to sleep. And it says that Jael took a, pen, a tent stake and put it on his temple and took a hammer and drove it through his he head, through his temple, drove it so hard that the stake stuck, stuck into the ground. And he, she drove him that he was fastened to the ground and it killed him. So she got the credit for killing Cicero, Cicero and not Barak. You know, there's, there's all sorts of judges that rose up when Israel was rebelling against God and when they would turn back to God. They was voting for God for a while as long as this judge was alive and as soon as he would die, they'd turn away from God. They'd start voting Satan's way. Then God would bring in another judge. Some of the judges, and, and you know a lot of these, uh, Shamgar, Gideon, Tola, Jer, Jephthah, Isban, Elon, Abnon, and Samson. And each one of them judges, just like all the rest of the Israelites, they had to vote when God called them, do I go with God or do I ignore God and vote Satan's way? You know, some of them had a hard time of deciding. Like Gideon, he wanted all kinds of signs. But eventually, he did vote God's way. Thank you, Lord. And then you go into the time of the kings. There was kings that voted God's way for a little while. Then they would vote Satan's way. And maybe they'd go back to voting Sots. God's way. One good example was Saul. When he first started out, he was a good king. Uh, Jabesh Gilead was a, a good example. Um, the enemy was coming in up against Jabesh Gilead, and they was gonna they was gonna kill them all, or gonna make them all their slaves, or I can't remember exactly. But Saul called all of Israel and said, let's go save Jabesh Gilead. And they went and they defeated the enemy. But then later on, even though he started out good, fear started coming on him. And he made a ill, he, he couldn't wait for uh, Samuel to come make the sacrifice. He made the sacrifice which a king wasn't allowed to do that. It wasn't in his duty. It was either the prophet or the priest had to do the sacrifice. But he feared the people, so he went ahead and did a sacrifice. Well, it was a little bit. He started drifting away from God a little bit. He started going over here to Satan's side, started voting Satan's way. And then the next thing is pride comes into his heart. And he was proudful, and he made... When pride came into his uh, heart and they was fighting, um, I think it was the Midianites, he made an oath. Anyone in this army that eats anything this day until we have defeated the Midianites, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill. So he made that oath out of pride, saying no one could eat anything. Well, the army was getting tired, and his own son, Jonathan, didn't hear him make this oath. And as they was going through the, the woods, uh, Jonathan seen some honey there. He stuck his staff in it and raised it up to his mouth, and he ate honey. And it said his eyes brightened. In other words, he became stronger. And he was the main leader that helped defeat the, uh, the enemy army. I'm really condensing this story down, uh, just hitting the highlights. Well, then at the end, he was, he was going to kill his own son because of the prideful oath that he made. But the rest of the army said, if it wouldn't be for your son, we wouldn't have won this battle. And his son said, if you wouldn't have made such a dumb oath, the whole army would have been stronger and we would have completely wiped them out. We wouldn't have just won, we would have completely wiped them out but just because of his pride. So you see, he, he started drifting off a little bit of, at a time. And then another time, it was just downright rebellion when, uh, or disobedience, I guess you could say. <clears throat> when Samuel told him that he was supposed to attack 
Well, God told Samuel, and Samuel relayed it to Saul, that he was supposed to attack the Amalekites and completely wipe them out, kill everything. The sheep, the goats, the, the cattle, the camels, the oxen, the, the donkeys, and all the people. Well, he killed them all except for some of the sheep. I guess they were hungry. And maybe some of the cattle, I'm not sure. And he didn't kill the king. So he directly disobeyed God. And uh, so you can see that instead of voting God's way, it, he voted Satan's way. And each time it got easier and easier and easier to vote Satan's way until finally the final battle that he was in. Samuel had died and he couldn't hear, Saul couldn't hear the voice of God anymore because he had turned so far away from God he couldn't hear God speaking. So what's he do? He goes to a witch and asks her to bring up Samuel. So the final, the final straw was he went to a witch a false god, a false religion, witchcraft, and he completely turned away from God in that final battle, then he lost his life. So you see, we're called to vote each day. You know, there's things that come up in our lives every day. And if you vote one time Satan's way, the next time it gets easier and it gets easier and you think, well, this isn't so bad and you keep going over this way. You, you turn from God and you, and you start over towards Satan's way and that's what happened to Saul. You know, and then, then if we go on to see like David, David was a man after God's own heart. You know, he followed God. He asked God what to do almost in every situation. He voted God's way, but one time when it was in the spring and it was time for the kings to go out and fight, David stayed home in the castle. So he chose not to do it God's way this time. And he got bored and he was walking around on top of his castle and he seen a woman bathing in a, a nearby house steps a little closer to Satan. He votes Satan's way. Oh, I'm going to look at this. Then he inquires, who is this woman? Most of you know the story of David and Bathsheba and how he continued to go a little bit further and a little bit further towards Satan's way. When he finally he committed adultery, he murdered her husband to cover it up. And then finally, when it was brought out into the open, he confessed his wrong and he turned back to God and said, I have sinned against God and asked God to forgive him and God did forgive him. So each one of us every day, we're voting. Maybe you voted the last three months God's way, but it only takes one time voting the other way and you, you could drift away from him. You know, King Solomon was considered the wisest man you know, up until his time, he was the wisest man that ever lived. Now, we could say Jesus Christ was a little bit more wise or a lot more wise than, than Solomon, but out of all the rest of the men, he was the wisest man ever at one time. He prayed for wisdom. He turned to God. He said, God, give me wisdom. I don't know how to run, to rule over your people. I need wisdom for that. God granted him wisdom. But then Solomon started marrying wives outside of the Jewish religion. That, and these wives followed other gods. So then Solomon started like, a, you know, I'm just going to, this isn't actually in the Bible, but this is probably how it happened. This wife that um, worshipped another god said, how about building me a temple for this God? So he'd build a temple. And then another wife said, well, how about my God? I need a temple for that, for, for my God. So he built, and it says that he built temples for these 
other gods. But I'm sure it was because his wives asked him to do it. So the wisest man on all the earth all of a sudden started turning away from God and started building temples and, and high places for these other gods so that the wives that he married could worship their gods. And eventually he turned away from God. So, you know, we can, we can uh, serve God part of our life, but we got to serve him our entire life. We need to vote God's way every day, all through the day. Another good example is Queen Esther. You know, Queen Esther, um, I think the king's name was Azarias or something like that. I can't, I, I can't uh, remember exactly. Folks, uh, we had a little technical difficulty. Uh, Michael's going to try to patch them together. It left out the second part of my sermon. The, uh, the camera had a malfunction and he got a different drive in there. So uh, I'm going to start here where I was at talking about Queen Esther. And uh, anyway, K Queen Esther is the story about Queen Esther was it was a king called Azarias, and he was the king over the Persian Empire. And this king, he was so proud of everything that he had uh, done and, and all the all the countries that he had conquered that he threw a big party for all his princes and his nobles and in this party it lasted 180 days so they knew how to party back then and after it went 180 days and the party was over he decides well what are we going to do now let's have another party so he decides to go seven more days and at the beginning of this day uh, the seven days and they were all drunk and partying and feasting and, and whatever they did in these parties. I'm sure it was a lot of things that wasn't very nice done in these parties that he called his queen, Queen Vasti, to come out and parade herself in front of all these nobles and show herself off because he thought she was so beautiful. So, you know, well, I say you know, but some of you know how drunk people act and how obnoxious they are so queen vaste said i'm not coming out and parading in front of all your nobles so she she refused to do it the king gets mad and he says to his nobles and his princes what are we going to do to her for not obeying me and they said you need to get a new queen so in the process of getting the new queen they they have like a contest and they they get all the young virgins over the whole uh, empire of Persia, and they have like a contest to see which one of them that he chooses. Well, he eventually chooses Esther, who is a Jewish girl. And Esther was, a, was an orphan, and her uncle had raised her, and his name was Mordecai. So Mordecai raised her, and he convinced her to to get into this contest and and she wins she becomes queen and uh so it goes on i don't know years later months later however long it is um mordecai offends one of the high nobles in the persian government his name was haman and haman was so mad at mordecai he wanted to kill all the jews in the in the the land of Persia, which was um, most of the known world back then. And so he wanted to kill all the Jews. And uh, so Mordecai goes to Esther. Well, he, he wasn't allowed into the castle. So he sent messengers into her and asked her if she would go and uh, talk to the king about this, to have this uh, revoked because the king signed it into law that all the Jews of the land would be killed. And Esther says to Mordecai, she sends a message back, I can't go in to the king because if I go into the king, uh, he has to hold out his scepter to me or to anyone. And if he doesn't, that person will be killed. 
And so she says, I'm not going to do that because I've taken a chance of being killed. So then Mordecai, she sends that message to Mordecai. Mordecai sends another, another message out to her saying, back to her saying, that if you don't do this, you're going to end up dying anyway. Don't think that you'll get away and from hiding in the castle that it won't be found out that you are also an Israelite. So when he sends this message back to her, he says, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy family's house shall be destroyed, and who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. We are all here and now, just like Mordecai said to Esther, for such a time as this. That's why you are living in this time and the place that you're living for such a time as this. Well, Esther went back into the king. She, she pleads to the king. Um, anyway, the enemy turns it around on, the, on Haman. Him and his whole family are killed. The Jews, it was another proclamation. Now, you understand back then they couldn't reverse a law. So the enemy still could go and fight the Jews. But it was another proclamation saying the Jews had the right to fight back. So they uh, conquered all their enemies that day. And it's just, you know, just like so many times throughout history, whenever a country would try to annihilate, try to wipe out all the Jews or all the Israelites, God would turn it around and that country would be defeated. A good example is Germany and, and different countries throughout the the Bible that tried to wipe out the Jews, they eventually had their downfall. And you know, there's countries today that's trying to kill all the Jewish people. They're trying to push Israel into the sea. Well, God will be their deliverer. He will raise up someone to deliver them out of the hands of these evil people. Thank you, Lord. So anyway, God put us here for such a time as this. He's telling us to vote. Vote for God, not for the devil. You know, in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, it says, this is Moses talking to the Israelites, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and they, thy seed may live. So God gave him a cho choice. Choose life, follow my commandments, or choose death, follow Satan's commandments. You know, Jesus took it one step further when he said in John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I come that you might have life and life more abundantly. So when you're choosing life, you're choosing abundant life. But if you're choosing to follow Satan, you're choosing death. Even Jesus had to take votes when he was walking on the earth. You know, uh, it says that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Well, he had to choose. Am I going to follow the, the Holy Spirit's uh, leading or am I going to ignore him and and do the easy way out. Do I want to fast for 40 days, or do I want to just go ahead and start into my ministry? So Jesus had to make a choice. Do I follow God, or do I follow the easy way, which is the easy way is usually Satan's way? Well, he chose God, you know, and for 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted. And then at the end of these 40 days, Satan comes in and says, eh, if you're the son of God, Command these stones to be made into bread. But Jesus said to Satan, Man does not live, it is written, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So he didn't choose Satan's way, he chose God's way. He chose to follow God and not take the easy way out. 
Then Satan took him up on top of the temple and said, cast yourself off because it is written. Now, Satan starts to quote the Bible. He said, it is written that, uh, that he will put his angels charge over you, that you won't even strike your foot on a stone. But Jesus said, it is also written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So he voted God again. He didn't vote Satan. He didn't want to show off and show that he could jump off. And it wasn't time yet for him to do miracles and, and things like that. He had to be in God's, not only be what God said to do, but do it when God said to do it. So he couldn't do that. And then also then Satan took him up, <coughs> excuse me, and put him on a high mountain. And he said, look at all these kingdoms. If you bow down and worship me, I will give you all these kingdoms. Well, you know, it was in Jesus' heart to that all the kingdoms of the earth would follow him. Well, this would have been a shortcut. This wouldn't be the way, this wouldn't be God's way to get the kingdoms to follow him. So he had to decide, <coughs> excuse me, am I going to follow God or am I going to follow Satan? Excuse me. And he says to Satan, it is written to worship the Lord thy God and him only. And then he says to Satan, get thee hence or get away from me. And it says that Satan left him and <clears throat> that he came back. Uh, he left him for a season. So it, you see that one time of voting against him didn't get rid of Satan completely. It got rid of him for that moment. But Satan tempted him all through his ministry. You know, one of the places that he um, tempted him was when he was talk, talking about his death, his future death, how he would die. And one of his own disciples, Peter, said, Oh, it won't happen to you, Lord, surely not. And Jesus said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. So in other words, Satan was using another person to tempt him, just like Satan used the ten spies to tempt the um, Israelites in the, in the wilderness. Instead of following what Caleb had to say, they followed the ten spies. So Satan couldn't tempt Jesus directly, he used other people to try to tempt him. You know, uh, also Jesus, when he was at his uh, getting ready to, to die on the cross and he went into the garden and was praying and he, and he told the, the Lord, he, he told the Father, Oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. So he was a little bit attempted there not to go through with the cross. Satan was saying, you don't have to do this. But Jesus decided to go God's way. He went through Several times he asked God to take this cup away from him if it was any other way. But he voted God's way. He did not vote to do the shortcut because the shortcut wouldn't work. You know, and, and Jesus asked us to vote each and every day. Several times a day. You know, just as he did his disciples 2,000 years ago, and all the other people that were following him. He said to Peter and Andrew, or Simon and Andrew, which was also Peter, follow me. This is in Matthew 4, 19. And it says they left everything and followed him. He also said to one of the, the people following him, he said, follow me. This is in 
chapter 8 of Matthew, and let the dead bury their own dead. In chapter 9 of Matthew, he tells Matthew, follow me. And Matthew left everything and followed him. So all throughout the the Bible, or all throughout the uh, four Gospels, he was telling people to follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. It was another another thing. And then in John 14, 15, he says, If you love me, keep my commandments. So we can choose to follow Jesus, keep his commandments, or we can choose to vote Satan's way, where oh, we'll keep some of his commandments. He also said in John 13, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. So we can decide, well, are we going to love one another, or are we not? Oh, that person there is a little hard to love. I'll love uh, 90 of them people, but them other 10, I don't think I'm going to love them. No. That's Satan's way. God's way is love them all. you got to love everyone, even though sometimes we feel that they're unlovable. In John 13, 35, um, oh no, Matthew 6, 14, it says, Forgive men their trespasses, and your Father will forgive you of your trespasses. But if you don't forgive them, He won't forgive you. Well, now, God's saying, forgive. Satan's saying, man, they've really done you dirty. You don't have to forgive them of that. It's okay to forgive people of some things, but, but that there was over the top. You need to hold that grudge. That's not what God says. You need to vote God's way. You need to forgive. God says in, in Luke 6, 38, give and it shall be given to you. Satan is saying, you better hold some of that money back. You know you got bills to pay. You know... Uh, you, you want to do this and you want to do that. You need to save some money for, for uh, a new car or you might want to go um, on vacation or something like that. You better put some of that money in the bank and not give it all to God. No, you need to vote. Do I give or do I keep it myself? In Matthew 28, Jesus told his disciples to go ye therefore into all the world, teach all nations, baptizing them, teaching them to observe all the things that I have told you. So God's saying, go. Satan's saying, "Uh, just stay here. You do good enough by just going to church. You don't have to go out into the world and and take this message. As long as you and your family is uh, okay, then then you'll be okay. (coughs) So we need to vote. Do we go or do we stay? <clears throat> Jesus is asking us to vote every day. All throughout the day. Many times during the day. He's telling us, follow me. Satan says, don't. Keep my commandments. Satan says, you don't have to keep them all. Jesus said, love. Satan says, oh, if you love some, that's good enough. Jesus said, forgive. Satan says, don't. Jesus said, give. Satan says, keep it for yourself. Jesus said, go. Satan says, stay. The enemy says, no. God says yes. We need to vote today for life and life more abundantly. Let's pray. Father, we just pray that this message was heard and received. And Father, we just pray that I conveyed this message to your people the way you conveyed it to me so that we could take this message out and further your kingdom and be doers of this word and not hearers only. So Father, we just uh, we just lift this message up to you and Holy Spirit, we give you freedom to touch hearts, to change lives. In Jesus' name, amen.
Now remember, folks, next week we won't be here. So we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you.